There's yttrium, ytterbium, actinium, rubidium, aboran, gadolinium, niobium, iridium, and strontium, and silicon, and silver, and samarium, and bismuth, bromine, lithium, beryllium, and barium. Welcome back. In the last video we talked about a computer simulation, or I showed you a computer simulation of the polymerization process. In this video we're going to cover the next stop point, which is all about properties of different, different polymers, and what those properties lead to in terms of how we can use them. I'll read the actual stop point. It says, describe the uses of the polymers made from the above monomers in terms of their properties. So a couple of things to stop point. Obviously the verb itself is described, so we have to have some detail in terms of description from how these polymers are made. And it says above monomers, and with that I mean ethylene, polystyrene, so styrene as a monomer, and mineral chloride. Those were the monomers. And we have to talk about what kind of polymers to make and what kind of uses these have due to their properties. So how the properties of these monomers allow it to be used as certain different things that we might use in everyday life. Before I start, I'll talk about properties on how these different polymers actually get their properties. And how is all to do with their structure? Structure of polymers gives them their properties. For example, when we have low density and high density polyethylene, they're all the same. So it's all polyethylene for both the low density and the high density polyethylene. So the ethylene part was, this was just a ethylene monomer. And remember ethylene monomers was just had two carbons and four hydrogens and was an alkene. Now you can imagine each of these gray dots for both low density and high density polyethylene are your ethylene monomers. And the difference between the two is in one you have a straight chain, so the different properties. It's linear, which means it's straight, so you can see that it's straight here. Whereas for the low density polyethylene, it's highly branched. So that's the difference. And what that hap what that means is that, for example, for the high density polyethylene, because it's linear, we can fit a lot more into the same space. This space has four imaginary polymers, end by end and side by side. But it's here in that same space, because it's a branch and you can only fit a few in, you only have two of these polymers. Which is why I call high density and low density. High density because they have a lot more fitting into a small place. Density is a lot more. But low density, because they're branching, you can't fit that many in. Another difference between the two is the for the high density, as a high average molecular weight. So one of these polymers is quite long. It goes for quite long compared to low density polyethylene. Whereas yeah, low density polyethylene have a much lower average molecular weight, which also means they're usually quite sh a bit shorter as well. But I put it low in brackets because it still has quite high, but just overall compared to high density. And also the word average is important because it's average means that there's going to be some which are a bit bigger and some which are a bit smaller. It doesn't mean that they're all exactly going to be the same length. So there's always going to be a discrepancy because the process of making ethylene polymers is not completely like industrially perfect. It doesn't make that same exact length all the time. It's just an average. And there's going to be some quite a bit lower and some are quite a bit higher from the average. That's what that low average molecular weight means. Now with the actual branching, what that makes it, it makes it flexible. So for the property, one of the properties, these properties are in blue, it's flexible because of that branching. Because you can't fit them in, it just becomes flexible. It also low, has a low melting point because usually if you have quite a few close together, there's dispersion forces and these dispersion forces hold it together. And once they're broken, then it's melted. But because of less dispersion forces for low density, it has a lower melting point. And it's also insoluble. And the reason why it's insoluble is it just has only these CH bonds. And these are hydrophobic, so they will not react with water. And they don't form bonds of water. So both low density and high density polyethylene are insoluble, which means they don't dissolve in water. For high density polyethylene, it had a high melting point. And the reason why is because you have so many of these chains together, and they all form these dispersion forces between the chains. And that gives it a very strong toughness. And also means that we have to put in a lot of energy until we can break all those bonds. That's why it has a high melting point. And yeah, same reasons why it has a high melting point, also why it has high tensile strength, because they're so close together and they're so these dispersion forces hold them together that it just gives lots more strength compared to low density polyethylene. And also it's insoluble, same reason, because it has those CH bonds. So it's low density, high density polyethylene. And when it comes to structure of polyethylene chloride and polystyrene, 
polyvinyl chloride is also linear, but it has a large large molecule in the side chain. And what I mean by that is I mean this chlorine molecule. Even though it doesn't look large here, but you can imagine if this were a chlorine molecule, then this, even smaller than this, would be a hydrogen molecule. So even though they look the same size here, a chlorine molecule is a lot bigger, which means there's something sticking out, which is quite big. And what that does is it makes it rigid. Because what you can imagine is, with these things sticking there, these green things being the chlorides, they prevent it from moving too far. They make it not be able to move to sideways because of that thing sticking there. So you can't move up and down and sideways. It's going to be staying in its place most of the time because it's just being blocked by that big chlorine molecule. That's also chemical resistant. That's another property. And the reason why it's chemical resistant is again, do that chlorine. It has a chlorine in this chain. And chlorines are just make chemical resistant. Now, the one problem is it's vulnerable to heat and UV light. All the other ones we mentioned earlier had all those CH bonds, so those CH bonds. But whereas in this case, we have one C, so the chlorine attached to, uh, the carbon clash attached to a chlorine bond. And this is quite weak. So this is quite weak. So if we have sun exposure, so heat or UV light, so either heat or a sun, this will break this bond. And once it's broken, then this whole structure disappears. So it's vulnerable to both heat and UV light. That's one negative property it has, polyvinyl chloride. But yeah, it was rigid because of that chlorine in this molecule. has chemical resistant and was vulnerable to heat and UV light. Now polystyrene. Polystyrene is a polymer made of styrene. Styrene is the monomer. And remember, styrene had a massive benzene ring, which was this one here, in its chain. Now again, you can imagine the same thing here. Now this time, this was last time I had chlorine, which was big, but this is very big. So I wrote very large side chain, and that prevents it, makes it even harder for it to move in any direction. This is just completely stuck. And that makes it the other one, so polyvinyl chloride was rigid, was really stiff, whereas this is extremely rigid, very, very stiff. So you can imagine that it's not going to move much out of place at all. It's just going to stay there. And it's also insoluble because even the benzene, it was all just still CH bonds. CH bonds are hydrophobic, as we mentioned earlier. So these don't form bonds of water. So these are insoluble. So polystyrene is insoluble and extremely rigid. But one thing we can do to it is we can blow air through it. So you can imagine these ones here is air. So if it's molten, if it's liquid, and we blow air through it, and then let it just become plastic or solid again, then you're going to have these air bubbles in it between the structures. And what that's actually going to do is going to create styrofoam. And the reason why is because we have that cushioning effect. These air bubbles give that cushioning effect. And also, because there's air bubbles in between layers, there's heat insulation as well. These are the properties of styrofoam. So this was styrofoam if we blow air through it. Whereas otherwise it's just called polystyrene. So these were some of the structures and the properties. Now, now I'm going to relate them to the actual uses because that's what the dot point says we should do. So here are some of the uses. So for example, for low-density polyethylene, we said that they have a low melting point, they're quite flexible, and insoluble in water. Now, for example, what we can make out of that, we can make cling paper, and that makes sense because cling paper needs to be quite flexible. We can make those sandwich bags, again, makes sense, they're quite flexible. So this was the cling paper here, the stuff that you put around your sandwiches. Sandwich bags are things you put in sandwiches inside. Now, also your soft toys, so I gave the squeaky duck as the example. Again, it's flexible. If it's really hard, we don't have a rubber duck, but this is made from low-density polyethylene because it's flexible. And same with those squeezable bottles, so like your ketchup and your mustard bottles. They're all made, many of them made are made of low-density polyethylene because of those properties. But we can't really use them in anything that's too hot because it has a low melting point and we risk it melting. But we can also put it in anything that needs water because it's insoluble. So we, some, some containers that have water in it can be made of polyethylene because it won't dissolve in water because of that property. So that's how some of the properties relate to uses of low-density polyethylene. Whereas for high-density polyethylene, we have a high melting point and it's very tough, very hard because of that crystalline structure, which is when all, the, when all of those polymers are really close together. But it's also insoluble because of those CH bonds. Now these were the properties, and this is what we can make out of them because of those properties. We can make wheelie bins. Now the wheelie bins 
makes sense. Again, this plastic is really tough. So it's hard plastic. It's not soft plastic like low-density polyphylene. Those cooking utensils. Cooking utensils are really useful when it comes to making it out of high-density polyphylene because, first of all, it's tough. That's good. But even think about the high melting point. If you're going to put something in with low melting point, if you would put in low-density polyethylene, this would actually melt. You don't want to have cooking utensils melting. So the properties of high-density polyethylene make it really good for using for cooking utensils. Also garbage bags. The garbage bags, these are going to be really tough bags. They're a thin coating of plastic, but they're going to be really tough. Because you're going to have lots of stuff in your actual bags. That's why high-density polyethylene is a good material to use to make garbage bags. And also your hard plastic containers in your toys. So quite most of your toys would be made of high density polyethylene, but stuff like your squeaky squeaky ducks would be made of low density polyethylene. But so these properties of high density polyethylene make it perfect for those kind of uses. Polyvinyl chloride, on, on the other hand, we said the properties were that it was rigid, was sensitive to light and heat, and chemical resistant. But we use it in things like electrical insulation. So most of our home electric insulation was actually due to um, made from polyvinyl chloride because it doesn't conduct electricity, so it makes it a really good insulator. We use it for garden hoses, for raincoats, and for drainage and sewage pipes. Now drainage and sewage pipes make sense. If it's rigid, you know, we can make really good sewage pipes. But some of the other ones don't really make that much sense. If you think about it, if it's rigid, how can we make garden hoses? Well, there's something called a plasticizer. So I'm going to write that word, plasticizer. Plasticizer is something you can add. So you add it into the actual plastic, and it changes the properties. So if we add plasticizers, we can actually make it more flexible. So we can make it more flexible. So instead of having a rigid one, we can make it flexible and have a flexible plastic. And that's what we do for, to make, for example, the garden hose. We have our normal vinyl chloride plastic. We add some plasticizer in it to make it more flexible and thereby we can make an into shape that garden hose. Also, for example, with the drainage pipes and the sewage pipes, some of the pipes have to be over ground, like they have to be in the sun. Now the problem is with, for example, if you're, if you're using polyvinyl chloride, you're gonna be light sensitive. So you actually might, you just, as soon as you go into light, this plastic might actually melt. But if you add plasticizers, again, you can add plasticizers to, cook, to overcome this problem. You can make plasticizers that will make this plastic not decompose in light or heat. All right, so by adding that, you can give them the additional property to be able to use it in those kinds of circumstances. But they generally make good pipes because they're really tough, but you need to add plasticizers to make it really useful. And with your raincoat as well, a raincoat, obviously, you're going to use that mostly when it's raining, so there's not going to be that much sun out there. But imagine you would be using a raincoat, it's raining, but then the sun comes out, and as soon as the sun comes out, your whole thing just decomposes, that would be pretty bad. So you might have to use your plasticizers to make it light resistant, light resistant to UV decay. All right, so for polyvinyl chloride, we use these things called plasticizers to modify some of the properties if we have to use it for certain things. So we can make it UV light resistant and heat resistant and flexible depending on the plasticizer we use. Then last but not least, we've got polystyrene. And they get used for those plastic parts and tools. So, for example, this the covering here. That's often polystyrene. And also those car batteries, those really tough car batteries. And the reason why is because, remember, one of the properties was that it was extremely rigid. Not just rigid, but extremely rigid. And you can imagine, those car batteries are really hard plastic. And by using that polystyrene, which has that benzene ring it, we can make that really strong and tough plastic. So that's why we use it in those kind of uses, just because it's really tough plastic, and in those kind of those kind of equipments would have to have that plastic. But if we actually blow this, so this was the normal one, but if you blow air through it, we get something called styrofoam. So I mentioned earlier, those air bubbles in between the layers make it change the properties, and the added properties are heat insulation because there's so much air between the layers now that heat can be trapped in there, so it has heat insulation and also has a cushioning effect. And because of those two new properties, we can use styrofoam for foam cups. So for example, if you have that hot coffee in there, even though it's really hot, you're not gonna feel it that hot because that heats and insulation. So it makes good foam cups. And also it makes good packaging material. Because
because of that cushioning property. So if you put your stuff in there, like you, know, you put a picture or whatever in there, it's not going to break because of that cushioning property of styrofoam. So those were some of the properties and how they relate to uses. So clean paper, sandwich bags, soft toys, squeezable bottles and shopping bags for low density polyethylene because they're flexible because of that high branching. And we can also use things which are, have water in it because they're insoluble, which means that it won't dissolve if we use watery subs, stuff in our, in our low density polyethylene products. For high density polyethylene, wheelie bins, cooking utensils, garbage bags, hard plastic containers and toys. Main thing because it was really tough and had a high melting point, which meant that these wouldn't be breaking and they, they have to have, for example, a wheelie bin has to be quite tough and that's a good, pro, good one to use for that kind of use. Polyvalent chloride. It was quite rigid, it was sensitive to heat and light, and chemical resistant. If we added some of the plasticizers, we could change the properties to make it resistant to heat and light, and making it flexible as well. And thereby we could use it for things like garden hoses, raincoats and drainage and sewage pipes, and electrical insulation. Polystyrene was extremely rigid because it had a huge benzene ring, which meant that the actual chains couldn't move much. It's also insoluble in water. And that made it a really good plastic to use for car batteries, for example, and, and tool handles, because that requires a really tough plastic, and polystyrene is more or less the toughest plastic there is. Foam cups and packaging foam, that was for styrofoam, because if we blow air through it, it changes the property slightly. We get that heat insulation property and the cushioning property from those air bubbles in between the actual layers, which makes it good to make foam cups and packaging foam. But that was enough to, to go for that dot point, but I hope that video was useful. Thank you for watching.